What happens when you get so busy that life just, I mean, the weeks just run together, the days run together? It's one of those times when I like to get, and I work all week on my sermon, I'm through my head, and it goes through my head, this, okay, this works good, this works good with it. And then I say, all right, well, I'm going to take an evening and sit down and get all my notes together and, you know, compile it, get, act, act like it's, you know, in, a, in an organized manner. And then, all of a sudden, how is it Saturday evening? I mean, you know, Tuesday would have been a good day. <laughs> Wednesday, Thursday, all of a sudden, it's Saturday evening. And I'm sitting down and looking at my notes. Well, here's the thing. There's always something to do. Always. I don't care if you live on a, a postage stamp or if you live on a thousand acres. There's always something to do. All right, so here I am running like a crazy person trying to build a rabbitry for my wife. At the same time, wrangling horses. I could show you a text from my neighbor. And quite often, well, basically it says, horses are out my south pasture. Okay, I got them. Horses are out again. Okay, I got them. That's all that we ever say to each other. So this morning, I get in the shower, get out of the shower, get dressed, and my phone goes off and his horses are out. Okay, that's it. So I'm over there trying to convince these horses to get into the trailer because they're going to live in the trailer for a few days. And uh, I'm lying. I'm not going to leave them in the trailer for a few days. So they're going to do that at least till this afternoon. So I drove them back over to the house, and I'm thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous. Satan has got me so busy trying to keep those stupid horses in. And I've preached about this since, probably since I've been here. I've got an 80-year-old fence. It's geriatric, folks. I mean, come on. I'm not, I'm not going to give up on a fence just because it's got a little age, right? Well, the problem is they can push through it real easy. So here I'm working on it, day after day after day, patching this, patching it here and here and here. And I've gotten so busy at running getting the horses back in, that one, I'm doing my church a disservice. Because every time I go somewhere, I've always got to run back to get a horse in. I'm doing my family a disservice because Sunday mornings, okay, I need y'all to stay here because the horses might get out again and I'm an hour away. So I'm doing them in a service. So God puts it on me today. When is the last time you were going to fix the fence? And I started thinking back. Well, I think the first time I said it was, it's like a million degrees out here. This fall, when it is nice and cool, I'll just walk through this fence. It's not a problem. And what happens? By the time it's, it's getting cool, we've got fall kids coming. So now we're having to take care of babies and, and you know switch mamas around and, and do the milking and all this stuff. And then, well, I'll do it, you know, later this, you know, for, for springtime. But then, you know, I love the cold weather so much that I'm like, you know, I ain't going out in that stuff. That's ridiculous. I'll wait till spring. And then there's foals coming in the spring. And then there's, and there's always something. Every time I think I'm going to go out there and do it, there's always something else that comes up. So God told me this morning. Yeah, there ain't nothing else coming up, Jack. You're going to get out there and fix your fence. 
So, I was thinking about that this morning. Not having a good sermon all lined up, but you know how that goes. When I do a good sermon, God always waits until the last minute and goes, by the way, you might want to go to Luke 12. And that's what happened. Luke 12, we'll start about 16. Luke 12 and 16. So many Christians, so few Bibles. Next time I'm going to do, do Bible drill with smartphones. Be You'd be faster. Yeah, I wouldn't have to shoot you for trying to find the index before we even start, right? Chick, my mom said, why are you going to shoot that guy? Because, look who it is. <laughs> Starting at 16. Jesus said to them, watch out, be on your guard against, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> 16, and he told them this parable. They're okay, i got to get my old man glasses on just a minute. Wow, there's words here. And he told them this parable. The ground of a, of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns, build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of goods laid up for the many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? So I want to stop there. That's the, that's the part that got to me. What if? I usually can't stand the what if game. But let's just do it for a little bit. What if I said to myself, Self, I think come September, October, when it gets a little cooler, you need to build that fence. Well, what happens if while I'm waiting on that, they plant me come July. Then what have I done? I left my wife and granddaughter to fix a rotten fence that I should have fixed 10 years ago. Matter of fact, 12 years. We've had this pasture for 12 years. So 12 years ago, I should have fixed this fence. I left that for my wife and granddaughter. And that's what hit me this morning. God put it on me. What happens if they plant you next month? There's someone else that told me this week, and it's funny how this comes up. I forget where the conversation come up. They said, if I died tomorrow, would you be happy with the last conversation we had? See, now, this fence got me to think about that. How many of us have gotten crossways with our brother or our sister or our parents and said, you know what, I'm just going to talk to you right now. What if? I remember my grandmother talking to, uh, talking to, I believe it was my sister. Her and her husband were arguing. And my grandmother said, you know what? For 47 years, I listened to your grandfather argue and complain and gripe and moan. And for 40, 47 years, I said, I wish you would quit that. I'm tired of hearing it. She said, and I would give anything today if I could hear him gripe. Anything. Anything. 
the last thing that you say to someone. Now, I'm telling you right now, I am a human being. I'm a pastor, but I am a human being. I'm going to offend you. I'm going to let you down, and I'm going to downright tick you off sometimes. I am. Now, the question is, are you going to get mad at me and never talk to me again? I couldn't bear that. Uh, I got crossways with my brother one time, and it lasted out of about two weeks. And for two weeks, I was miserable. Until I went to my brother and said, I'm sorry. And I'm telling you, no one here, no one here has more problem with pride than me. Okay? God knocks the wind out of my sails a lot because he knows I've got problems with pride. But I could never let my pride deprive me of family. And I'm talking about brothers and sisters and parents, and I'm talking also about brothers and sisters in Christ. Church members from that, that I call family. I don't recall ever getting mad enough at someone to say, I'm never going to talk to you again. And I think about people that I, that I know that, that have said, well, my parents have disowned me. What? Or, I'm not talking to my parents. They made me mad. We are of a generation of offended people. I'm talking about people getting PTSD because they're offended. Really? Is that really something worth losing someone in your life? I'm mad at what the preacher says if I'm not going back to church. The first church I preached at, a man came to church and was, as a matter of fact, is now uh, an elder at that church, but, or was the last time I talked to him, but he came to church and his wife said he hadn't been to church in 30-something years because he got mad at the preacher. And the only reason he stayed at church that time is our first church service was at a horse sale that he was attending. I kind of snuck it in on him. And his wife said, are you going to want to leave and come back? He said, no, I'll stay here for this. And we had a church service. We left. He uh, left that Sunday. We came back the next Sunday. Same arena. No horse sale. He was there. And he came back to God. But the question is, how many, 30 years of blessings that he lost because he got mad at a preacher? How many years of blessings, of love, will we lose if we get crossways with a brother and sister? I'm never talking to you again. If my last words to you were I'm never talking to you again and I never was able to apologize, it would just devastate me. I make it a point every time I leave the house, every time I talk to my mother and father, my brothers and sisters, it does not matter who it is, the last words I say are I love you. Because what if I don't make it back? You fool, your life will be demanded of you this very night. 
You will never have that opportunity. Now let's go another step. How many people do we know that said, you know what, yeah, I know I'm lost, I know I need to get saved, but I've got time. How much time? Every day, every person in this church, every person in this country, every day mounts a lethal weapon, a missile, and drives through traffic. What is a missile? It's a projectile with explosives. So we got a packed up missile on 635. And of course we're in Texas, so not only do we have packed up missiles, we got warheads with six shooters, you know what I mean? So who knows who's going to make it back? Who knows that they're going to have a chance when I get a little older to come to know Jesus? And you don't, bar you don't bargain with God. He says, it's time you're coming home. Or it's time for you to leave the earth. You don't have time to say, oh, Lord, can you give me about a week? And then next Sunday, I'll, I'll accept Christ as my Savior. No, no, it doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. How many people have gone to a grocery store or convenience store shoplifted and when they got caught going out the door they said well here I'll give it back did that work out so well no they got a free ride in the back of a police car there are some things that you can't wait and then at the last minute do it because your very life could be demanded of you tonight Who here has made sure that every person that they know knows that they love them? I have a young lady sends me these little blurbs all the time and we send them back and forth. And one, one thing she sent to me was never, uh, and it was a, because it was my wife and I, she said, you don't have to tell your wife you love her. Just don't give her any reason to doubt it. Well, I try not to give her any reason to doubt it, but I also tell her I love her. There are many times I tell her I don't like her girl a whole lot right now, but I still love you. There are times when I tell her I would really love to hug your neck just real tight, just for a minute. But I love you. And there are many times that she says, yes, and I love you. Yes, I plan on killing you tonight in your sleep. But I love you. Luckily, I've dodged the bullet. Literally. But how many of us have people in our lives that we're not comfortable with the last thing we said to them? How many of us here today, how many of us sitting in this church are comfortable with the last thing they said to God? How many of us here sitting today are comfortable knowing that we've never spoke to God? If there's someone here today that has never started a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ, never, I challenge you today, look at your heart. Look at yourself. Do you have that relationship? Do you have that, that assurance knowing that if you leave this earth, you're going to be with God in heaven?
more people are, are worried about what they said to their spouse, what they said to their parents, what they said to their children, what they said to their friends. And they never think about what they said to God. And one other thing is, are you comfortable with God knowing or thinking about the last thing you said to Him? If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, but you shook your fist at God, and God will never see you again because you'll go into the pits of hell, are you comfortable knowing that God's going to have to bear that as well? The Bible tells me there will be no pain in heaven for us. I wonder how many times God's heart has been broken. If you're here today and you've never started a relationship with God, if you've never talked to Him, I ask you to, to follow me in prayer. Lord, I've been on my own. I haven't trusted you. I haven't talked to you. Lord, but I know that you've, you've loved me the whole time. Lord, I know that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, into the world to be a perfect sacrifice for me, that he died, he was buried. Three days he was risen. He lives today and he's coming back. Lord, I want him in my heart. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit. Empty the sin out of my life. Lord, lead me. Guide me in this world. Lord, guide me right up into your arms when I leave it. Ask these things in your son's holy name. Amen. That is the most That is the most important thing. Just a minute. Hello. Now, that's the most important thing you can do. Is talk to God and accept Christ as your Savior. But more than saying it, you must believe it. What's the last thing you said to God?